Hi, I'm Dr. Stephen Rich. I'm coming to you from my home, but I am a professor at the University of Massachusetts and I direct Tick Report, which presents the tick testing service to those of you that have subscribed to that service in recent months and years. I'm pleased to report to you that Tick Report is operational, so we have a special permission from the university to continue to run this essential service, and that's precisely what we're doing, and everything's running quite smoothly. I will tell you that the hard-working men and women of Tick Report are putting in the extra hours and, and, and doing a, a terrific job. Usually we'd be recruiting additional seasonal employees to assist them during this very busy Tick month of May and June. This year, because of COVID-19, we're unable to recruit, hire, or train new personnel. So we're working with the, the Cracker Jack crew that we have all year long, um, but without that additional seasonal support. So just stay tuned and we'll keep you abreast of how our uh, progress goes. We're going to do our best to make sure that we deliver this service because we know a number of you value it. At the very end of today's talk, I'm going to link you to an email site where you can go on and, and get on our mailing list and keep abreast of everything that's going on with Tick Report. But the business at hand today is really I want to tell you about our May Tick Talk, which I'm very excited about. So when I thought about different topics that need to be presented. One of them is the alpha-gal syndrome, which is also known as the red meat allergy, although we'll see in a moment why red meat allergy is not the best name for it. But when I thought about talking about it, it seemed to me that we ought to really go and get some expert opinions. So I reached out to my friend and colleague, Dr. Scott Commons, who's an MD, PhD, and a professor at the University of North Carolina. Scott's one of the leading experts in the world on AGS, and most recently headed up a congressional subcommittee on the topic. I was fortunate enough to be on that committee as well. And Today, he's going to come and tell us about the origins of this, uh, of this malady, and which is very different than the infectious diseases we typically associate with tick-borne diseases. This is uh, as an allergy, so it presents some unique challenges, and Scott's going to tell us all about that. The presentation you see today was pre-recorded. It's a conversation Scott and I pre recorded a few weeks ago. Then we edited some for content and flow just to make sure that it is, is most useful. And Scott and I are actually going to watch it live with you. So we'll be watching right beside you and we'll answer questions in real time that you can pose into your devices. And we think this is going to be a great way to, to present the topic. I'm going to stick with this format for the next couple of presentations. We have Kirby Stafford coming up in the month of June. He's going to talk about tick control. And then a very special guest in July to, to discuss Powassan virus. And I'll tell you more about all that in the future. So apologies in advance if the editing of the, of the succeeding presentation is a little jumpy. And sometimes the connections weren't terrific. But um, bear with us and we hope you'll find this very informative. Thank you very much. This is, we're doing something a little bit different this time because usually we don't have guests and this time we, we do have a very special guest. So Dr. Scott Commons is with us and Scott is, has been at the forefront of the study of the red meat alpha-gal syndrome phenomenon since the very beginning, which he can, he can talk about. Um, his, your colleague was one of the individuals that first had the syndrome. That's correct. Dr. Platts Mills, who was my mentor at, uh, University of Virginia, where I, we initially described this in the U.S., and he, I think, would tell you that he had the he had the allergy, and it turns out that was actually really helpful because he was a ready source of of antibodies for us. To, to start from ground zero, just remind our viewers what an allergy is. What what constitutes an allergy? Yeah, so an allergy really. Uh, scientifically means that some someone's immune system has created an allergic class of antibody. We call that IgE as opposed to IgG or M, which tend to be more infection fighting. IgE tends to be uh, an antibody that triggers uh, an allergic reaction. You might think about it as anaphylaxis or shock even. Um, and it can be simple IgE to ragweed or dust mite that gives you 
nasal congestion and, and sneezing, but it can also be IgE to peanut, cow's milk, or egg that gives kids uh, allergic responses when they eat food. I knew where the working group had sort of settled, but I, I wasn't sure what the terminology is to even the preferred terminology, whether red meat allergy or alpha gal is the what the, what the colloquial ways of describing it are. Yeah, I I prefer alpha gal syndrome. Well, two reasons. I like the abbreviation AGS. Um, and then because it is more than just eating beef or pork, um, to me, it, the idea of the heart valves and heparin and all these places where you get animal products you don't normally think about sort of lend itself in that way to me to be a little bit more kind of a syndrome, I guess. Allergies to ticks or tick proteins is not entirely new. We know that there's a tick paralysis that's been described decades ago. And there's some suggestion that maybe people get routinely uh, mild allergic reaction to tick bites, which may actually prevent disease transmission or infection transmission because of the people's response to ticks. But the real game changer is this, I guess we're going to call it the alpha gal syndrome, um, <laughs> but it's in colloquial terms, many people refer to it as the red meat allergy. And right. this is a game changer. This is you get bit by a tick and suddenly you can't eat cheeseburgers anymore. Right. And, and a lot of people are quite distressed by it. It's, it's a game changer, as you mentioned, for many reasons. Uh, not the first uh, or not the least of which is that it, can affect adults. So these are people who have eaten cheeseburgers or steaks or barbecue their entire lives and they love it. They enjoy that, those foods. And the tick bite seems to what we would consider break tolerance. So someone who's safely eaten steak for 50 years now all of a sudden eats a steak and has an allergic reaction. And this is I don't think we were as as in tune to the idea that this is so different from childhood food allergy where there really isn't this distinct period of, of tolerance. Many kids who have, say, a peanut or tree nut allergy may have eaten one of those uh, proteins at some point, had an allergic reaction, and then really never had it again. So mm -hmm. it's not as though they have this longing for peanuts or tree nuts. Mm -hmm. Our patients have eaten beef for 50 years mm -hmm. and all of a sudden they can't. And it really produces in some of them this sort of deep uh, sense of regret that they, that they can't have uh, steak or pork anymore. Um, so that's one definite difference about the, the alpha gal syndrome that, that we've come to really appreciate is that people actually, deeply miss the foods that they can no longer can no longer eat and that idea of tolerance is very fundamentally important i think for people to understand because the thing to which the allergies directed or which those ig antibodies are directing themselves is a sugar or a carbohydrate that's in virtually all the meat that we eat from basically mammals animals with fur Mm -hmm. And the only exception to those mammals with fur, that, the ones that don't have alpha-gal are our closest cousins, the primates, which we don't generally tend to eat here. So, so it's a tolerance to something that if we're meat eaters, we've been seeing it our whole, whole lives. And suddenly that tolerance of that sugar, for some reason, is broken. Yeah, Right. And that's where we think the tick bite comes in is that, mm -hmm. and, and scientifically, it's intellectually satisfying that the tick bite could play a role in this because as you mentioned, your immune system has seen this alpha gal sugar, which is present in all lower mammals. And for years, right, people have successfully eaten beef or pork or lamb or venison, what have you. And they've, they've had an immune response that is regulated, meaning it's not allergic. And then all of a sudden, for, for that immune response to change, to be one of allergy, it's, it's only to me intellectually satisfying if you have some reason for that to have happened. Otherwise, it mm -hmm. becomes this grand mystery that, that feels perhaps less scientific and, and more like an, an intolerance or um, something that could be in someone's head. But 
But we know the, these patients have detectable allergic responses to alpha-gal. Um, and it really seems as though this IgE or allergic class antibody develops after response to some tick bites. So my kind of cartoon understanding of immunology is that we, we have two lines of defense where we interact with the environment, thinking about it from the microbiology side or the entomology side. We sort of have our outside, our skin, where we're protecting ourselves from things like tick bites. And then we have our inside, which is the lining of our gut and our, and our trachea and our, 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 our respiratory system, which is also lined with a protective, with a protective system. But my understanding is that the protection that's the periphery that's going on in my blood and the protection that's inside my respiratory and digestive tracts are somewhat sequestered one from the other. So could it be that what we're seeing is that um, carbohydrates that are usually in the gut and don't cause any problem, when they suddenly get introduced into the peripheral blood by the tick bite, that that's just a whole new view for the immune system and sets it into this this, um, this, this mode, or is that just an oversimplification? Or no, I, I think it's, it's a great um, way to, a fra great framework uh, in which to think about this, because we know that going through the skin is really a fantastic way to make an allergic response. Mm -hmm. And there's, there's increasing lines of evidence that that may be part of what is going on with childhood food allergy, in fact. Um, so, your, your point about um, kind of two distinct uh, mechanisms or, or ways in which we, we defend our, ourselves from an immune system standpoint, it may well be that something that happens to the skin can cause uh, a certain class of immune response that may be, may be quite different than what's happening in the gut. And the, the deeper story with alpha-gal and what in the literature is called anti-gal. So anti-gal meaning the, the immune response to alpha-gal as a sugar. It seems as though there are bacteria that are in every human's gut that stimulate an endogenous immune response to alpha-gal. So if you take it from the 30,000 foot level, all humans make an immune response to alpha-gal. For most of us, that's not a big deal at all. For a few of us that get tick bites, that immune response then seems to become part of an allergic class response. And because all lower mammals have this alpha-gal sugar, once as a human we start to make an allergic response, then we know it when we eat the beef, pork, lamb, what have you. And to your point, it appears that the endogenous response that all humans have continues in our patients who develop the allergy. So they may really, as you alluded to, have a response in the gut that they've had for their entire life that we all have, but then through the skin, they've now developed a separate allergic response to alpha-gal. So it, it's, it's complicated, but I think you're, the idea of the two systems is actually in this particular example, a, a perfect way to think about it. So I'm gonna switch over to your slides, Scott, and maybe we could talk about some of the things that people would be looking for, because my guess is based on the kinds of feedback we get, people are gonna to wanna to know, how do I know? Or what, what would be a clue after I get bitten by a tick that I'm gonna have a problem with the next steak that I eat or that I'm gonna encounter some kind of issue that I've never had before. As you might imagine, having a, a new onset allergy to beef, pork, lamb, et cetera, in, a, in an adult who's eaten that for years was a bit of a shock to the system. Um, it was a paradigm changing view. Um, so we often would say, people at first we really just had you know 10 to 12 patients and they would their initial sort of entry was uh you know I, doc i think i might be allergic to beef 
they would say this weird, the reactions don't happen right away. And that's a big thing. These reactions are delayed. So in addition to the paradigm changing viewpoint of, hey, you know, I, I've eaten beef fine for years and now all of a sudden I'm allergic. You eat a hamburger and nothing, literally nothing happens right away for most people. It mm -hmm. takes three to six hours for symptoms to develop. Mm -hmm. And at that point, you're usually not even thinking that you're, that the food, that the food is the cause. If you get hives at midnight, you're not thinking about dinner. You're thinking about, you know, what's in my bed or what, what, soap did I use uh, for my nightly shower kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And and then sometimes patients would say, you know, I, I started to think that every time I had a steak, I was getting hives. So I thought, well, maybe it's beef. And I had some roast beef and nothing happened. And so they would say, ah, well, so it can't be beef. And then they'd have a steak again. And sure enough, it would occur. Um, and so that was confusing because the reactions are inconsistent. It's not a high fidelity response. And sometimes they would tell us, look, I just get some itching or some redness. Then other times I'll get itching, redness, GI distress, trouble breathing, you know, throat closure. Um, so the range of reactions can be quite different. Some of them said, you know, I, I was really concerned it was beef and had a pretty good idea that that's what was going on. So I started to eat a lot more pork. And then I'm um, now I'm bothered by pork as well. Some of the patients who uh, we found early on even said, not only does pork bother me, but I started eating lamb and now it's lamb as well. Mm -hmm. And actually that was kind of a big clue for us because not only was it weird for patients to have a new onset allergy to beef, but for it to be beef and pork and lamb, it, it was a big, big jump start towards identifying alpha-gal as the actual allergen because it's, it's contained in all lower mammals. So in, our, in the allergy world, it makes a much tighter, more uh, coherent story that a patient would be allergic to a single epitope or a single allergen that would be contained in all these foods as opposed to, you know, one protein in beef, a second protein in pork, something else in lamb. Um, and the other kind of important point is that almost all of allergy is predicated on, on proteins. So if you're allergic to cats or dogs or, or ragweed or dust, it's all protein based. And this alpha gal syndrome is based on a sugar. And so it's a unique idea that people can develop an allergic antibody to a sugar that has real clinical importance. Seems like the other practical take home there is knowing that it, that pork is involved and pork's often considered the, another white meat. <laughs> important to, that, that's an important distinction for the red meat allergy designation that it's not just what we think of as classically r red meat. Yeah. Yeah, that's very true. It's, it turns out that was quite an effective advertising campaign. And, and we definitely have had people who said, I, I, I was told I had a red meat allergy. So I went home and, and bought pork and it happened with pork too. So yeah, we, we do try to educate in that way as well. You're correct. So in your world, people would more commonly call, refer to it as alpha gal syndrome as opposed to red meat allergy. Yeah. I, I think it does, it, it does lend itself to both um, names, but I worry that by calling it red meat allergy, we still, as you hinted at, um, can have this instance where people are, are then eating pork because they think it's a white meat. And what about other products from, for example, dairy? Is yeah, dairy, you know, obviously, uh, um, mammal, mammal derived, uh, dairy has alpha gal, um, since it comes from cows and especially the fat content, uh, the higher fat content foods are, are increasingly linked with more severe reactions. So, uh, dairy in the form of, um, of ice cream and, uh, rich, heavy cheeses or cream sauces, is frequently an issue for folks. Um, they may be able to tolerate a piece of cheddar cheese, but 
Um, sometimes the, the heavier fat dairy can be an issue. Well, that really underscores the shortcomings of red meat as a descriptor. Yes, that's a good point. Kind of the four, four big things that we talk a lot about are uh, dose matters, um, which is, I think, in some ways why the reactions don't happen every time, because you, you may not always eat a, a large amount of meat. Um, but the fat content is also really critical. So if someone eats a fair amount of lean protein, such as venison, they may, they may react only sporadically. And, and probably in those scenarios, it's because they happen to have eaten more uh, in a sitting than in other times. The other things that are, turn out to be really important for triggering the actual reactions in, in alpha-gal syndrome are uh, activity, like exercise. So if, if you've been working out in the yard or, um, or in the gym and then you have an allergen exposure, you're much more likely to react to, to that meal than you would be if you, if you just had the meal itself. And this is a, this is actually a common theme in, in all of food allergy. Um, but the other thing that comes up a lot in AGS is, is alcohol. And I think it's just because people might like to have a nice steak and a glass of wine or that kind of thing. And having alcohol also facilitates having reactions. This one I, I like to show because often when folks go to the allergist, they think about skin testing and for alpha gal allergy, this typical skin prick test um, or scratch test, if you will, doesn't really identify this so cleanly. So in this scenario, in this slide, sorry, the top, the plus is our positive control. And you can see that's fairly red. Uh, that's histamine. And then underneath that, the B is beef, the C is chicken, L is lamb, P is pork, T is turkey, and CO is codfish. And the actual allergen is underneath um, each of the, the letters. And then on the, on the far side, you can see DP and DF, those are both species of dust mite, then cockroach, cat, dog, and grass. And I, I like this slide because it makes the point that using this scratch test, really you don't get much of a, of a response um, that you would feel compelled to tell a patient, look, I, I think you have to take beef, pork, and lamb completely out of your diet. Um, to me, those, those red uh, spots when, when we were measuring them typically were less than four millimeters. And that's usually our cutoff in adults for um, calling something a positive response. And um, we do an intradermal test where you've taken some of the same antigen and put it under the skin kind of uh, in a similar vein to a PPD or a TB test. Now you begin to see a significant impressive reaction and this, I think, becomes much more convincing. Mm -hmm. Early on, we didn't have a blood test that was widely available. So we were having to use skin testing uh, to the various foods pretty frequently to, to try to make a diagnosis. We, as a field, don't encourage intradermal testing to foods. Mm -hmm. So now with the availability of, our, of a blood test, um, we've gotten, we've really gotten away from needing to do the skin test because the blood test is, is much more uh, acceptable and widely available. So I included a few pictures here of um, food challenges where we were really trying to understand, could, could you feed someone, uh, we were using pork sausage, but could you feed someone what they were allergic to and and really nothing happens as the patients had reported. Um, and so we were testing that in the, in the research environment. Um, and so I've got a few slides of this um, patient. I actually uh, let go home before he had been with us about five or six hours and really nothing much had happened. So we let him go. And when he got home, he started to, to react. So this is, um, slightly over eight hours after he ate a few pork sausage patties and got this impressive, you know, flushed skin and, and hives uh, diffusely. He, he never had shortness of breath, but clearly had a reaction 
and literally didn't have I mean, I, I let him go. He didn't have anything to show for it in the clinic. So it, we, we really began to, to demonstrate that this alpha gal syndrome, you can have various periods of, of non-response and then out of the blue, seemingly out of the blue, uh, symptoms begin. So the next slide, I think, um, yeah, this is another volunteer. So she had um, skin splotchiness and itching and then later had GI distress. Her symptoms started about three hours and 50 minutes after consuming meat. So the difference there, uh, sort of the eight hours, closer to four hours for her, patients would individually kind of tell us, you know, I, I tend to react at four and a half hours. And some of the experiments we did seem to, to support that, that each, each patient may uh, have kind of an individual time frame for their, react, their reactions. That does seem to be influenced by alcohol or activity, but at baseline, there was a range of, of a time frame for folks. This slide I included because um, on the, well, on my right, um, the patient's palms um, appear to be uh, reddened and, and perhaps a little swollen. This idea of red itchy palms comes up over and over again when we talk to patients who have alpha-gal syndrome, when they have reactions, the, the palms are not uncommonly a very early sign of a reaction. So these, her, the other side of the slide is, un unfortunately I did um, cut them off when we were taking the, the before photo, but one side is her, her palms at baseline and the other is uh, close to three and a half hours after eating pork sausage. This is ZMAP, which is a, uh, essentially a crowdsourced website where patients can upload their data and just indicate that they are been diagnosed or suffering from alpha-gal allergy. It's not a, um, so we assume that people aren't just uploading data for, for um, others of us to, to wrangle over that these are actually people who, who really have been diagnosed and care to share uh, their information with us. So it gives us a sense, at least in the U.S., yeah, so this is the global version of, of where in the world is alpha-gal allergy and shows some hot spots in Europe and, and uh, Scandinavia as well as uh, Australia and South Africa. And we talk a fair amount about Lone Star ticks, but I'm by no means wedded to the idea that it has to be Lone Star ticks. And certainly the, the global distribution would suggest that other ticks absolutely can do this. I think w what we are working on is to understand in the U.S. are there other ticks involved and what you know which species can do this because there are a lot of cases on Long Island and my understanding is they have a healthy population of, of Lone Star ticks but equally uh, Exodes scapularis. There again, there's interesting parallels between the tick paralysis, which has been around for decades, and it was initially thought to be associated with one species of tick from Australia, but it turns out that the protein that's produced by those ticks is produced by dozens or, or scores of different tick species, mostly to a lesser extent than that, Af that Australian tick paralysis tick, but it's not unheard of elsewhere, which is why tick paralysis kind of shows up around the globe. And your point is right. Like, Amblyoma americanum, the proper name for lone star ticks are just, they wouldn't be found in these different spots. So I had, I, I liked this slide because when, you, when, when I'm seeing patients, you know, we, we do talk a fair amount about tick bites, but I also, so some patients will say, well, I, yeah, I really can't remember an attached tick bite. And I think there's a fair amount of confusion in general population about uh, seed ticks or larval tick bites and chiggers. And so this is um, actually a, a picture of, of seed tick bites on, a, on an ankle. And 
you know, when I show this to, to people, they might say, ah, it looks like chigger bites to me. And I think that that points to the idea that if we just ask patients, have you had tick bites? They often think about an attached adult or, or other um, phase that is, you know, maybe engorged, maybe not, but, but they think about, I think frequently just an attached tick that, that they have to pull off to remove kind of thing. And to me, this, this alpha gal story um, probably equally involves these seed tick bites. And it's just a difficult question because not everyone calls it the same thing. And um, on the right hand side is a little jar that we get from Oklahoma state from their tick rearing facility. So there's, you can't really appreciate in there, but there's a single um, adult female who laid all those amblyoma americanum eggs. And I, th I think the visual helps because sometimes it might be difficult for people to say, well, I mean, how can you really get a hundred seed tick bites at once? And then you see how many eggs they lay and how if you brush by the wrong leaf at the wrong time, you really could end up with 50 or a hundred seed tick bites. I guess that's one end is lots and lots of ticks, many, many seed ticks, which are emanating from a single egg mass. And then the other end is just that one adult or nymphal tick that bites you and you never, you never see it, which I think you mentioned at the beginning, a lot of people don't even remember getting bitten by the tick. Right. In some ways you're, in terms of predicting your outcomes, you're better off if you had something like this, where you're clearly going to remember you were bitten by something and hopefully can discern a tick from a chigger or <laughs> like ours could help you to just make that distinction as opposed yeah. to the one tick that bites you in the middle of your back. And it just is a passenger for a couple of days and it falls off and you don't remember it or know about it. Right. Which clearly points to the reason why we need the study with human biting tick data and longitudinal um, blood, blood sampling to understand what the risk is, how many people develop the allergic response, and um, can we help characterize which, which species of ticks and perhaps even which life stages are the most important. Even here in the Northeast in places like Cape Cod and coastal Massachusetts where Lyme disease has been a problem for decades, we're still amazed by the number of people that report you know, having Lyme disease and never having remembered being bitten by a tick. So. Yeah. <laughs> so to that point about the, about the risk factor, so there's clearly a tick bite association. What's the, uh, what are the options and what are the preferred options? So it could be that there was something inside the tick, mm -hmm. endogenous to the tick. Could be something that's left over from the tick's previous blood meal if it fed on, for example, a deer, which would be within the alpha-gal syndrome meat types. Right. Or it could actually be, have we ruled out that it, it may be a pathogen that's producing something that's an alpha-gal mimic and inducing that kind of response. Is there some sense of which of those is most likely or? Yeah, that, and that's a, it's a, it's a great question. And certainly active research in my lab, as well as those around, um, the country and, and probably in Europe and Australia as well, asking this exact question, what is it molecularly and antigen wise about the tick bite that really causes this? And I, I think you, you've hit on the major uh, ways in which that could occur. I would add to your, um, I really like the third idea, which is that there's some bacterial antigen that is in many ways sort of, prodding the human immune response. Um, I say that because when these seed tick bite uh, episodes become important in triggering the allergy, then you have to think, well, they haven't had a blood meal. Um, so then somehow that hypothesis becomes less, um, I think, uh, intriguing. Uh, but I know that there can be antigens that get passed trans ovarially or trans statally. And so I don't think it rules out that idea, but I have started to favor this hypothesis that 
a bacteria that's kind of along for the ride, maybe like a Rickettsia amblyommatis. Um, it doesn't really have a big association or a strong association with human disease. Could be potentially causing the human immune response to alpha-gal to be triggered if, if someone is bitten by a, a, a single tick or multiple ticks that, that perhaps have, have Rickettsia amblyommatis and they're able to, to sort of push that uh, IgE or allergic immune response. Why alpha-gal is an antigen? Um, there is some work with, that Shahid Karim's lab uh, has done to suggest that some ticks are able to create in their own sialome uh, an alpha-gal-like antigen, if not alpha-gal itself. Um, evolutionarily, I'm, maybe there's some advantage for them to do that with the idea that it sh perhaps shouldn't trigger um, the host immune response if we are quote unquote tolerant to, to alpha-gal from the bacteria in our gut that, that you and I talked about earlier. Um, but maybe the, for whatever reason, the addition of Rickettsia amblyommatis um, to that uh, salivary milieu somehow triggers this immune response. I, I, and so I struggle with that. Um, and then how do you, you know, if that's true for the southeastern U.S., is is amblyommatis a big deal in Europe and, and Australia? And, the, you know, I think the the date the data are um, are not clear to me. I guess I've heard both, um, but it's yeah, it's it's a one of those things where we're actively working on it because it is such a fascinating question. I think we're just scratching the surface on what's out there in terms of rickettsial commensals and or pathogens and mutualistic responses. It's mm -hmm. it's a curious phenomenon because most of what the microbes, I won't call them pathogens, many of them are pathogenic, but mo most of what the microbes and ticks are trying to do, along with the ticks themselves, is dampen down immune responses so that they can get to doing what they want to do, which is get the blood out of the host and get it into their belly. Yeah. And so this would be a weird um, uh, malfunctioning of that primary function, but, but also not surprising because the ticks and the microbes inside the ticks do so many things pharmacologically to to change to alter that feeding lesion mm. i guess it wouldn't be too surprised if they accidentally produced something that that set off a red flag for the immune system this picks up exactly on the point that you were making so this is a an arm of a volunteer who uh, allowed a lone star tick uh, this is an allergic alpha gal allergic patient allowed a lone star tick to feed uh, on his arm probably can only be done by scientists, right? So, and you can see there's a, an impressive response. Unfortunately, in the bottom picture is the original is blurry, so it projects blurry. But the upper picture is, I think, 12 hours in, and then the bottom is closer to a day and a half. We had planned to keep the tick on for three or four days, but, but the, the skin response was so uh, impressive that we had to remove the tick early, actually. And this type of, of skin itching, redness, and persistence at the site of the bite is a characteristic that a lot of patients who develop alpha-gal allergy talk about. This idea that something is different about a certain bite and it leads them to have this redness and itching. Now, I think a large portion of people have these exaggerated skin responses at the site of bites. I, it's by no means unique. It just seems as though it begins to predict perhaps a subset of people who go on to develop AGS. Interesting. I think there's a point in there that people will want to know also that it's not all tick bites. So there's a, there are factors that are yet to be described, but we don't perhaps even have any idea of how, what the percentage of ticks, but right. a message that we always give about Lyme and other pathogen associated tick-borne diseases is not all ticks are infected. In fact, other than Lyme borreliosis, most of the pathogens are relatively rare. And so it's not all tick bites. It's not all tick species. And the other thing that we know for pathogens is the ticks usually have to feed for a length of time. 
who knows how long the feeding has to take place in the case of alpha gal. Right. It's, it's, it is an absolutely unknown aspect because we constantly tell patients to make sure they get ticks off as quick as possible, do their tick checks routinely. So no one's leaving them on in place. And based on our mouse model work, it seems as though it takes a few repeated exposures, but we're looking forward to trying some of these experiments with actual ticks as opposed to tick extract that we inject to try to get at, at, at your question and your point exactly. Our data, I think for at least for black-legged ticks, it's about 7 or 8% of the ticks that we receive are what we would call fully engorged, so ticks that have fed for better than 48 hours. I don't know if that holds true for amblyoma as well, but there are a lot of people out there that are sending us ticks that have been on them for a long time. This I included because scientifically, the way you do the experiment, right, is to actually put certain ticks on people and let them feed and then follow them longitudinally, but we can't do that. Obviously, capitalizing on natural occurring tick bites is, is really important. And, and this is one of the limited sets of data that we have. And this is a single patient who um, was diagnosed with alpha-gal syndrome on July 10th, and her alpha-gal IgE level is shown there with the orange dot, so somewhat less than 10. Her total IgE, which is really just a measure of her full complement of allergic antibody responses, was slightly over 20. So percentage-wise, actually, her alpha-gal IgE makes up a fair amount of the total, which is, is a striking characteristic of many of the AGS patients that, that that's true. Actually, that total, any total under 50 is someone who you might say, well, probably not allergic, but it turns out in the alpha-gal syndrome side of things, you can have a fairly low total IgE with a significant a positive. So she asked us at, at the time of diagnosis if there was anything that she could do to help the study of, of AGS. And I said, well, if you, if you get additional tick bites, let us know, because sometimes we can use that data to try to, to help answer some of these questions. And she was in the garden over Labor Day and, and got 50 to 60 seed tick bites and, and called. And so we were able to follow her alpha-gal IgE level after naturally occurring tick bites. And this was really one of those scenarios that doesn't come along very often because we had just seen her 60 days prior. So it was fortuitous for us and, and she was a good sport about repeated blood draws. So you can see this kind of nice rise in the alpha-gal specific IgE as well as the total uh, in the weeks after the tick bites, which are shown on the red, that's the red bar. And then that alpha-gal IgE begins to wane over time, which is a phenomenon that we tend to see. It, it does not in many cases appear to be a long-lived memory B cell response. It, it seems as though these are a population of B cells called plasma blasts that, that appear in the periphery quite quickly and, and essentially push out a lot of antibody and then begin to fade. So in many cases, the natural history of this is that people will be able to have it resolve over a period of time. This slide also makes the point that if you have additional tick bites, you may have a rise in your alpha-gal specific IgE and therefore a perpetuation of the syndrome. Was she ex exhibiting symptoms? Was she, did she have an allergy or just the antibodies? She had an allergy. She actually um, had an allergic reaction at a July 4th barbecue, which brought her to the clinic on the 10th. I and see. so we had asked her to kind of do a red meat uh, avoidance diet. So she was not having reactions during the September, October timeframe because she was already on the appropriate diet. Now, this is just a kind of a summary slide for our approach at UNC for kind of managing patients that have developed AGS. We, I talked a little bit about the avoidance diet. Obviously, uh, mammalian meat and the fattier cuts, we talked about the fat content being important. Ice cream can be a particular bad actor. However, Dairy and cheese are often tolerated by patients um, if it's not super high fat. There are a few issues that, that occur from time to time with gelatin, but most patients uh, are able to have gelatin, whether it's marshmallows or gummy bears or in a capsule. And then we talked about exercise and alcohol earlier on. Those seem to be the two great facilitators of reactions. And then 
recent tick bites, as the previous slide made the point, those can really seem to raise that alpha-gal specific IgE, and that may set someone up to have a few more symptoms if they're not on an appropriate diet. Occasionally, we do these pork sausage challenges to try to help folks uh, understand whether they're now clear of the allergy or to try to help make a diagnosis if we need to. But those we we have a little bit of trepidation about those sometimes because they, they can really produce a significant reaction. So we like to do those in the in the in the clinic under supervised conditions if we need to. And we haven't talked a tremendous amount about this all yet, but we do talk about bioprosthetics, whether it's heart valves or ligaments that could be derived from, from pigs or cows or other mammalian sources that may contain alpha-gal. Patients can often do okay if they need these, these bioprosthetics, but we really like to be involved in the conversation to try to help with pre-medication regimens and reaction management if needed. Some of the vaccines can have gelatin and Zostavax, which was a shing is a shingles vaccine, actually had a fair amount of gelatin. We had a few reactions from time to time. Fortunately, there's a new shingles vaccine available that has been uh, successfully tolerated by our patients. So um, MMR has come up a few times. Obviously, that's more uh, frequently given in, in kiddos, but it, that vaccine as well has a, has a small amount of gelatin that, that could be a problem perhaps. I hadn't thought about gelatin. Giving up a cheeseburger in a summer barbecue would be bad enough, but Giving up s'mores just seems cruel. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So then I just, I always like to try to educate folks because, you know, we really weren't aware about patients who would report GI specific symptoms when we initially described this. The, the patients who were coming to our attention in 2007, 2008 were ones who were, honestly, they were getting hives. And so they would be referred to an allergist in that sense. What we've come to find out in the years since then is that there are patients who simply just have GI symptoms. They eat a hamburger two hours later. They may have nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, but they don't get hives. They don't have redness or swelling or chest tightness. And it can be really challenging to make the diagnosis for those folks. But when you do and you get them on appropriate avoidance diet, their GI symptoms will improve significantly if not completely resolved. So I always like to mention that just for education's sake. Also the idea that this food allergy does seem to resolve in a lot of folks if we can keep them tick bite free for a period of time. And then just to reiterate that the reactions can be quite inconsistent. And that seems to be something that's probably influenced by the things that we talked about earlier in terms of the dose or the volume of the meal, the fat content, the possibility of having exercise or alcohol involved. So yeah, this is, um, you know, we thought we knew a fair amount about uh, food allergy and then um, we, we really, ha actually, I, I'm not sure we appreciated that these tissue valves, uh, heart valves that are bovine or, or porcine derived actually do have alpha-gal on them. And so we had a patient with the meat allergy who who had anaphylaxis uh, following valve replacement. Uh, yeah, so this is just a title of an article that really uh, made the point that despite the fixation process, we we still see preservation of alpha-gal epitopes in the bioprostheses. And heparin, as we talked about, uh, and you see circled there, it's made from porcine intestine and well as as cow lung. So heparin is one of those things that people often get uh, in the hospital or for procedures. So low dose heparin has largely not been an issue, but um, sometimes when you get full anticoagulation, as they say, uh, you get a lot of units of heparin, 50,000, then we've seen some hives and, and reactions. And I, I like this slide just because it, you know, we're good at using every portion of, of animals. And so this speaks to the syndrome aspect of, of this allergy and that there's a lot of places where porcine and bovine derived 
tissues and materials end up and and many of them are not well labeled so it's it's been an educational process on us as well as patients to really try to have a a safe avoidance diet and think about all these various exposures and i'm not trying to indicate that sheetrock or felt or or glass is uh, gonna gonna cause an allergic reaction but just to make the point that the, these porcine and bovine products can be in a, in a lot of things we use every day. I think the next slide sort of makes the same, same point from the pig side of it. You can still throw a football and play drums and, and drink tea out of bone china, but it's, um, it's just, as we indicated with gelatin, you know, there are, there are downstream ramifications of this alpha-gal allergic response that I think we're still learning about. There is probably a relationship between the lack of response to the to the scratch test or prick test that we talked about and the fact that people don't react to sitting on leather or uh, walking on linoleum. And, and the reason that is, in our opinion, is that while some of these products can be derived from pigs and cows, it does not necessarily mean that all of the products are gonna have this one alpha-gal sugar on them. So certain tissues and cells and organs of the animals may have more or less or no alpha-gal. And so what, what may appear in pet food is something that, yes, it's porcine derived, but, but may not have any alpha-gal sugar on it, or it may be treated in such a way that the sugar gets digested uh, prior to, to the product being put in a bag and, and sold so that it's not, it's not every exposure from a cow or a pig that, that creates a risk. It really has to have this alpha-gal sugar present. And, and a lot of these products may not at all. So I, I, I think this is the last one just to close because it offers a little ray of hope perhaps and some fancy science. So there are pigs that exist that are genetically edited to not express the alpha-1,3 galactosal transferase. And that's the enzyme that makes alpha-gal. So these pigs have actually been around for about 15 years because the transplant surgeons wanted them in order to try to minimize hyperacute rejection. We talked earlier about the endogenous anti-gal response that all humans make. We thought, well, if these pigs could be approved for other medical or food-related uses, then it might be a safe source of heart valves or heparin or, or just tissues that we needed from pigs that we could use for our patients in a safe way. And equally, there probably would be patients who are interested in pork for consumption that would be safe as well. So there's work being done actually in North Carolina to try to move these pigs through an approval process that we hope we can be able to offer them in a medical and food manner, hopefully within the next couple of years, which I think would be quicker than we would have a vaccine or a, or a cure for the allergy. So perhaps this will be a kind of a stop, stop gap measure that we can rely on initially. That seems like a really good high note to end on, a <laughs> positive, positive note. I do want to go back and just maybe we can insert this. And so one of the things that we observe in people that send us ticks to have them tested, particularly when it's things other than Borrelia, and sometimes even things as common as anaplasma, so even a month ago, a friend of a friend was had tested a tick with us and they, they had fled their home in New York, gone to someplace in rural Pennsylvania, found a tick bite, didn't, couldn't go to the regular pediatrician, went to a local pediatrician when their tick tested positive for anaplasma phagocytophilum. And the doc there had never heard of anaplasma phagocytophilum. And so we were asked to, to link them. We gave them links to CDC so they had some information about that pathogen and associated. But something we hear pretty commonly is people haven't heard anything about this weird pathogen you test for. So I am, but I imagine there's a lot of self-diagnosis going on. 
People get bit by a tick and then they later they have a piece of sausage and mines are running wild and, and then they go to the doc and the doc's never heard of it. So is there a um, prescribed order of things that people could do both at home before they go off to the doc, but then also how they might point their doc in a direction that would help them to to get a resolution to those problems. So it, often they, you know, people say, my doc's never heard of the pathogen. And then we just link them to something and they can, they can take. You're right. This scenario does come up, especially in this, in today's era of, of self-diagnosis and, and Dr. Right. Google, you know, it, it brings up an important point, which is after a tick bite, getting tested for the, alpha gal allergy is not what we would recommend because so many people seem as though they may carry the antibody, but only a subset of those actually react. And, and this is an issue actually in all of food allergy, the antibody itself, that, that testing doesn't make the diagnosis. It's really the history in the setting with the antibody that give you the diagnosis. In, in many ways, we actually ask patients to wait to develop symptoms because probably so few tick bitten individuals actually develop this, this allergy. So we do think, you know, keeping track uh, in the, on the calendar of, of the tick, maybe put it in a bag or send it uh, for analysis as, as they desire, but don't necessarily go rush off to get an alpha gal allergy test done. Those are definitely best ordered in the setting of someone who, has had clinical symptoms. If this is something that someone is concerned about, then certainly keeping track of, of meals and antigen exposure, you know, meats or milks or whatnot is probably helpful. In terms of kind of educating one's physician, in many places, I think this is becoming more recognized, but there certainly are people who are, who are not aware of it. Fortunately, the CDC has updated their website to contain uh, alpha gal syndrome related information and that's probably a good place to to point docs docs to because you can link from there to the ordering lab in terms of being able to identify the correct testing that's necessary it's a fairly straightforward blood test it's largely performed by uh, viracor urofins which is widely available through a lot of third party labs whether it's mayo or labcor or quest so i i think once someone has symptoms, if they have this history of a tick bite, or as you and I've talked about, even if they're just outdoorsy, because you don't always remember a tick bite, it's worth ordering the test and then seeing where those uh, numbers come out. Mm -hmm. So yeah, in this context of everyone talking about contact surveillance, maybe people will be mindful of the fact that keeping a log of your diet might might be helpful to yeah that's right i think you can even just write okay. it down in your you know um handwritten kind of thing it's for us you know it's less one of those things where you want to know every single ingredient um i think initially broad strokes are usually the most helpful for allergists and for for um family docs as well just to try to you know understand hot dog or, or, you know, maybe identifying like pork sausage versus chicken sausage or that sort of thing could be helpful, but I wouldn't worry about, you know, full labels or anything um, that detailed right away. Well, thanks again, Scott. Um, You're welcome. You